We're in our series called Warrior. We're continuing. We're in our second week. And so uh, this past Christmas Eve, um, my grandpa and his wife uh, came and worshiped with us. I don't know if, if you guys know him. He is the original Virgil Peck. My dad's Virgil Jr. and I am Virgil the three and the third. And so some people call me number three. I will accept that nickname. There's other nicknames I will not accept, but I will accept that one. But anyway, I was with him, and uh, one of the things that uh, we wanted to do with Grandpa was we wanted to take him to the New Grill. Um, because when Grandpa was in high school, he was the evening manager at the New Grill uh, restaurant. And he, he tells me this story um, multiple times, but he told me again this story while we were uh, uh, together and he, he said there was one time there's a guy that was kind of known as a bully around town I'm not going to say his name because he's a businessman in the community people know him now and so to protect the innocent I'm not going to use his name but he's kind of known as a bully around town and uh, one evening he said grandpa said that this guy was trying to steal some of the silverware and he confronted the guy and the guy kind of kind of got in his face and got belligerent and, and said I'm going to meet you in the back alley behind New Grill if you guys don't know where New Grill is there's been multiple add-ons, but there was an alley uh, behind there. And so this guy went to the back, and he didn't think Grandpa was going to go back and fight him in the alley because Grandpa went to Christian Heights, and, and the public school guys thought that the Christian Heights guys were kind of pansies. But Grandpa went back there to confront this guy and to throw down. And Grandpa said, something came over me, and I just whooped this guy. He was bigger than me. He said he got a couple punches in, but it was nothing compared to what I did uh, to this other guy. And um, he said that later on he was hanging out with some of his friends, and, and one of his uh, buddies said, hey, Virgil, that's his name. Uh, he said, Virgil, what happened to you? What, what's, what happened to your face? Because the guy got a couple licks in, and then there was a girl that actually happened to be at the fight. She said, if you think Virgil looks bad, you should see the other guy. And uh, you know what? My, my grandpa's told me that story multiple times. I can't promise that it's not exaggerated. But grandpa, if you're watching this morning, I believe you. I believe the story. But, as, but as it starts out, it's a great illustration that, you know, as, as we step into this new year, um, I believe that for some of us, we're just sick and tired of being pushed around. And we wonder, when is it time for us to fight back? And so this morning, if you're watching us on Facebook, we're so glad they're watching with us. I know because of the weather, there's probably a lot of people watching uh, with us this morning. Just give us a thumbs up, a good morning, or hello. Let us know that you're worshiping uh, with us today. But we're in this series called Warrior. And what does it mean to be a warrior of God? Last week we looked at um, that there's a battle. There's a battle within. It's, it's a sinful nature. And we're going to tackle a little bit uh, a more next week of what that means and what that looks like. There's a battle without. That's the, the cultural pressures that you and I face. There's a battle against our enemy, Satan. And there's times that we want to quit the fight. There's times that we're just like, it's just too hard. The cost is too much. But last week we looked, like, don't, we looked at don't quit. The battle is worth the fight. And so we're encouraging you today, as we're encouraging you throughout this week, as we step into this new year, that God is calling men and women to step forward and to pick up the fight. Pick up the fight in so many different areas of our life. You see, there's a battle to be fought and a battle to win. Maybe there's a habit that you need to break. Maybe there's unwise relationships in your life that you need to remove, and I'm not talking about your spouse. Maybe there's some debt that you need to start paying off. Maybe there's something in your marriage that you need to mend. Or maybe there's sin in your life, unconfessed sin in your life, that through the power of Jesus Christ, you can overcome. This battle is not easy. This battle will cost you. And you will want to quit. But you are a warrior. And warriors don't back down. Warriors don't quit. Warriors understand the cost and they finish the fight. And so today, I want to speak specifically to warriors. And many times we see in the movies that the warriors many times are men. But there are some ladies that are some of the greatest warriors I've ever seen. There's prayer warriors. They pray. 
that when, that, when, that when they pray, the battle is won. When it comes to their children, ladies are the fiercest warriors. Have you ever heard of the term mama bear? They will defend their kids to the death. Today, I'm talking to some warriors that God does call men to lead their homes and their families. But we do realize that there are some ladies that are thrust <coughs> excuse me, into that situation, into that role. And they become warriors for their families. Today, I want to talk to some warriors. And is there any warriors in the house today? Okay, let me do that again. Today, I want to talk to some warriors. Is there any warriors in the house today? There we go. In our culture today, there's a confusion of what it means to be a man. Are we supposed to be gentle or tough? Are we supposed to be weak or pow- meek or powerful? In our culture today, there is a push to redefine manhood. And I think as a church, as a body of Christ, we're called to fight back and look at the biblical definition of what it mean- means to be a man. Specifically, what it means to be a man of God who lays down their life for those that are around them that God has put in their care. And as we look at Jesus, there's a tendency to look at Jesus as this Galilean that is meek and mild, that is good with sheep and kids, who's full of grace and full of love. And let me tell you, he is all of that. But at the same time, in the same body, the greatest warrior that ever lived was Jesus Christ, the Son of God that walked on this earth. And I believe that God has given you the heart of a warrior. And I want to use the nature of God and the person of Jesus Christ as a foundation of what it means for us today to be a warrior. In Exodus chapter 15, it gives an attribute of who who God is. And a lot of times we can put God in a box. But a lot of times we don't look at God as a warrior. So in Exodus chapter 15, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Jesus even said about himself in Matthew chapter 10, Do not suppose that I've come to bring peace on this earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a what? But a sword. In Luke chapter 4, and, and, and Jesus was in Nazareth, and he began to teach, and Jesus grew up in Nazareth, and a lot of people rejected him because they're like, Who is this guy? Who's this guy who speaks with authority? Who's this guy to tell us what to do? And so what they were trying to do is they were pushing Jesus to the edge of a cliff to push him off. And we don't know exactly what happens next. We don't know if it's natural or supernatural. But it says that Jesus turns around, looks at the crowd, and walks straight through it. Can I present a thought just for a second? Can I present a thought of maybe why Jesus was able to just walk through? Jesus was a son of Joseph. And Joseph was known as a builder. In the Greek, it, 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 it's, it's tecton. In a lot of our translations uh, in our Bibles, it's translated as a carpenter. But tecton is just simply someone who was a builder. And there was one thing that wasn't plentiful around Galilee, around Nazareth, where Jesus grew up, was wood. But one of the things that was plentiful was stone. And so I would deduct that, that, that Joseph, being a tecton, a builder, would not have been a carpenter, but probably more likely would have been a stonemason. And Jesus would have been under Joseph, would have learned the family trade, and would have been a stonemason or a stone builder himself. So I want you to imagine, just for a second... The upper body strength that Jesus had. And so when the people were trying to push Jesus off to the cleft, I'm sure that he had enough and he had a warrior's heart that he turns around, flexes his muscles a little bit, and people are like, "Eh, okay, I'm not going to mess with Jesus right now. And he just walks right through. Hey, I I don't know if that's exactly what happened. I, I like to think that way, but we don't know exactly what happened. But Jesus was a warrior. And he walks through the crowd. Thomas Torrance, he once wrote, wrote this, and I found, that, found this this week. He said this, The world likes a complacent, reasonable, reasonable religion. And so it is always ready to revere some pale Galilean image of Jesus, some meager and anem- anemic Messiah, and to give him a moderate, rational homage. 
our culture tries to reduce Jesus as this anemic Messiah. But we know as the body of Christ, as we see in God's word, as we begin to study that he is a warrior. And he's a warrior at heart. We see in Revelation chapter 19, we see this image that John the Revelator wrote about this warrior that was to come. This supernatural warrior. So if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to look at it real quick. In Revelation chapter 19, one of the things that we believe here at FSN is, is to get the God's Word into your hands. And so if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, there's a Bible that's in front of you. And you'll find Revelation chapter 19 on page 823. We want you to follow along uh, with us this morning. So if you have your Bible, your iPad, or, or whatever you have this morning, turn to Revelation 19. We're going to start in verse 11, Revelation 19, verse 11. We're going to look at this image of Jesus as a warrior. It says this in Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven standing open. John w- was talking, and he, he saw this image of this warrior, of this, this coming king. It says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and he wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. Verse 13, he is dressed in a robe dripped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The image, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Verse 15, coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So what is this image of Jesus? And what does this image of Jesus say to us today about the warrior of Jesus Christ? It says that he was a rider on the white horse. It speaks of honor. It speaks of power. It speaks of this victor that is coming. It says that his name is faithful and true. He is a keeper of his promises. That he is coming again, including the promise of his judgment that is to come. He has justice in his judgment and wars against those who reject him. Remember, he is a just God. He is just in his judgment. His eyes are like flame. means that he discerns and sees the secrets of men's heart. His eyes see our inmost being and reads us through and through. And on his head are many crowns, which speaks of authority and his royalty. The last time that Jesus was here on this earth, he wore a crown of thorns. But when he comes again, he wears a crown of a king. It says that his robe is dripped in blood, reminding us of the price that he paid for our salvation. And out of his mouth comes a sword. It's not like this image of a pirate with a a, a sword or a, a, a knife in his mouth, but the sword represents the power of his word. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. There is power in the words of Jesus. He rules with an iron scepter. His reign is firm, and he rules with triumph. And on his thigh is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. As a rider into battle, you wouldn't have your name on your chest. You had your name on your thigh so that everybody knew when they were going into battle who you were in a place of prominence. And there is no doubt who this warrior king is. This isn't a Jesus you can control. This isn't a Jesus that that can distract you or sway you. He is a returning king, and he is a warrior. And I don't know about you, But on that day, if I had to pick sides, I would want to be on this warrior's team. Jesus is full of compassion. He's full of mercy. But at the same time, he is a warrior and he's a conquering king. As followers of Jesus, he is our example. What does it mean for you and for me to follow this ultimate warrior? You see, God has given us three things, three things as warriors. But before you do that, before we jump into that, I want to remind you of what we looked at last week, is that you are a warrior. You will not quit. The battle is worth the fight. In your notes, write this down. I am a warrior. I will not quit. 
the battle is worth the fight. As we follow Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate warrior, who is our example, let me tell you today, you are a warrior. And because you are a warrior, you will not quit because you understand that this battle is worth the fight. So as warriors, what are the three things that God has given to us? The first one is this, is someone to protect. Someone to protect. In the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament, God, Nehemiah was commissioned to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He was facing incredible opposition from neighboring countries that were constantly coming to battle against him. And the people were beginning to be discouraged. And he has this like this brave heart moment in Nehemiah chapter 4. It says this, after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, listen to what he says, do not be afraid of them. Do not be afraid of those who come against us, because remember the Lord who is great and awesome. When you remember how great and awesome the Lord is, then you are able to what? Fight for your families. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. Fight for your homes. We need to rise up. And fight for our families and our homes and our marriages and fight for our integrity. Maybe today and this morning, you need to have some a little inspiration from Liam Neeson, who fought for his family and taken one, who fought for his family and taken two, who fought for his family and taken three. He needs a new role. Who fought for his family in commuter, who fought for his family in the cold pursuit. If you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. I don't know if that gets you jazzed up or not. That does me a little bit. As Jesus Christ is our example, we're called to fight. I know you, if you have a warrior's heart, you will lay down your life for the ones that you love. If somebody comes into your house, you'll do whatever you can to protect your family. No matter your size, your physique, or your strength, you'll protect them with whatever you can. But as a warrior, you're willing to die to protect those from physical harm, but are you willing to die to protect those from emotional and spiritual harm? To protect them emotionally, your bride and your fiancé, maybe your significant other, is you're treating them as a special gift that God has given to you. Encouraging them daily. Serving them daily. With your families, you're kind and patient. Firm, but also safe. Are we always going to get it right all the time? Are we always going to say the right words or have the right tone? Probably not. But when you do, Be quick to ask for forgiveness. This isn't a sign of weakness. This is actually a sign of strength. And as you grow in your relationship with Jesus, the more and more you'll be able to say the right things and say them in the right terms or say them at the right time. As warriors, we'll show our sons what it means to treat a lady by the way that we treat the lady that God has given to us with honor and respect. In my devotions this week, if you guys are reading through John, John chapter 13, Jesus said that that, that God had put all power under his authority. Jesus said that God had put all power underneath his authority. But what does Jesus do right after that? He says that he washes his disciples' feet. All power and authority has been given to Jesus. The very next act is he washes the disciples' feet. And I had this thought this week. Is that true power is to use your authority to lift up and encourage others. That's countercultural. That's countercultural. In our culture today, that if you have power, you have authority, you, you, you raise yourself up. But as followers of Christ, when he has given a, us power and authority, we use that power and authority to encourage and to lift others up. And so we protect those that God has given to us emotionally, but we also protect those spiritually. We are followers of God and as followers of Jesus. We're in the church as often as we can to be exposed 
to expose ourselves to the things of God. That as followers of Jesus and as men and women of God, we expose ourselves to the church and expose our things to the things of God. There's never been once where, where we as a family has woken up on a Sunday morning and one of my kids comes to me and he's like, Daddy, are we going to church today? Not once. Never in the, 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 the how old is my son? 19 years. 19 years that, that, that we have children. Not once has my kids come to me and said, Dad, are we going to church today? And that's not because I'm a pastor. That's because we believe so much in the body of Christ. We believe what the body of Christ has to offer us, that we want to be a part of the things of God. And I am so thankful for men and women who have had influence over my family for Jesus, whether it be in kids' church or or Club 56 or, or teens, whether it be in Bible studies or connect groups. I'm so thankful that men and women have surrounded us, have encouraged us as we encourage others, that we serve together as the body of Christ. We serve right alongside the church to protect those that God has given to you spiritually is is to put the things of God as a priority. And that growing in Jesus is your priority. And so as warriors, we have someone to protect physically, someone to protect emotionally, and someone to protect spiritually. And I heard a pastor say this this week, and I want to share it with you. Is there never should be a lady or a child that feels anything but safe, in the presence of a man of God, feeling both physically and emotionally safe. In a culture where we see men use their power to take advantage of the marginalized, to take advantage of men or or women and children, I want us to be a body of Christ. I want us to be the, the church that every lady and every child feels safe because they're surrounded by men of God who are there to protect them. That's the church. That's the guys that I want to surround myself with. In 2 Samuel chapter 10, it says this, Be strong. Let us fight bravely for our people and the cities of God. The Lord will do this, do what is good in his sight. So the first thing that God has given to us as a warrior, someone to protect. The second thing is this, kingdom to advance. A kingdom to advance. Maybe it's a ministry to fulfill. Maybe it's a calling that God has given to you. Maybe there's just something in your life that God has given to you to advance his kingdom. In Luke chapter 9, it says this, Then when Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them what? Power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 6, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. We don't seek, as men, as men and women who are warriors of God, we don't seek our kingdom first. We're not trying to build our kingdom. We first seek God's kingdom and say, God, where are you directing? Where are you leading? God, how can we help advance your kingdom here on this earth? Our bodies, our lives are built on the kingdom of God. And there's so many people who are distracted building their own personal kingdom that they've neglected the calling that God has for them. We say we are providing for our families, but we're not giving them what they need most. When we don't have time for the things of God, the body of Christ suffers because we're not stepping in to the God-ordained or God-given role that he has given to us. In Matthew 16, Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven Wherever you bind on earth, you will be bound in heaven. And wherever you loose on earth, you will loose in heaven. As a warrior, God has given us the kingdom, the keys of the kingdom. God has given you gifts, and God has given you talents to use for him, for his kingdom. Maybe God has given you the gift of being a businessman or businesswoman, and he's asking you to be the most generous person here at FSN. Maybe God is calling you to be the brightest and most encouraging person in the workplace in a place that is desperately needs hope. 
Maybe God has given you the gift to work with teenagers and kids. And you serve with FSN Teens or Club 56 or FSN Kids. And maybe you're the only godly influence that child has in their life. Or maybe God has given you the gifts and the passions to work with those who are marginalized. We have a kingdom to advance. We have a calling to fulfill. And a warrior without a fight that's not stepping into the calling, is a, rebel, is a rebel without a cause, that fights against the wrong things, that tears people down instead of builds them up, someone who, get, who wounds others instead of mending wounds, someone who first seeks their kingdom and doesn't advance the kingdom of God. A distracted warrior is a very destructive warrior. And so as warriors, God has called us to protect, someone to protect, a kingdom to advance. And the third thing is a battle to win. A battle to win. David, one of the warrior kings of the people of Israel, once wrote this about God in Psalms 144. It says this, Praise be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for the battle. There's a battle to be won and there's a battle to be fought. As warriors who have a heart of God, he prepares us for this battle. He equips you for the battle. He has given you everything you need to succeed in the battle. Maybe sometimes we feel ill-equipped or, 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 or uh, um, unable to, to fight this battle, but God has given you everything you need to succeed. Remember, as we looked at last week, the call of the Christian life is not to a cruise ship. The call of a Christian life is to a battleship, all hands on deck, using what God has given to us to do battle and to wage war of what matters the most. But maybe for some of us today, you weren't given the greatest example of a warrior growing up. Maybe you grew up in a home that wasn't safe. Or the influence that was on your, in your life was passive or angry. Or maybe this is the very first time that someone's ever told you, you are a warrior. You have what it takes. And you say, Pastor, I just, I just don't know how. That's the beautiful thing about the church, the body of Christ. Is that we're called to encourage and to equip and to spur one another on into this battle that God has called us to. That's why we have connect groups. We want you to be a part of one. We want you to lead one. That we encourage one another on. That's why we have celebrate recoveries on Monday nights. So that there maybe there's a hurt habit or hang up that, that's in your life that you just can't quite get over. And there's a group of people that encourages you, that lifts you up, that helps you overcome some of the addictions that may be in your life. That's why we have men's groups and ladies groups. Because we need one another. We need one another. As a body of Christ, we need one another. As we looked at two weeks ago, that this hour that we get together is not the push. That is the push. It's not the point. This hour we get together, we push one another on. We equip one another. This isn't the point. It's easy to be a warrior in here. But man, when it goes out there. So we have a battle to win, a kingdom to advance, and someone to equip. Sorry, someone to protect. And the final thing I want to give to you this morning is this. Is victory isn't always about what you conquer. Victory is about is being faithful and obedient today. Victory isn't always about what you conquer. Victory is being faithful and obedient today. What is God calling you today to do? Are you being obedient to him today? Jesus wasn't just victorious when he gave his life on the cross. He was victorious when he fought against the temptations of Satan. And Satan comes and he tempts us, tries to distract us. But what did Jesus do when the temptations of Satan came his way? It says in Matthew chapter 4, after 40 days of fasting, Jesus would have been hungry, he would have been weak 
in his body, but strong in his spirit. And it's the devil comes to tempt him. And these are temptations to preserve the flesh, to preserve the body. The first temptation is, Jesus, you're hungry. Why don't you take this stone and turn it into bread? And Jesus uses his sword, the word of God, to do battle against Satan. And he says to this, man will not live by bread alone. Satan takes him up to the highest place at the point of the temple. and says, why don't you jump off? God will protect you. His angels will come to protect you. That he uses the word, his sword of God, and says this, do not put the Lord your God to a test. He takes him to a high place and shows him all of the world and all of the splendor. And Satan says, I will give you all of this, which he had no authority over to do whatsoever. But he said, I will give you all authority if you just simply bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, worship the Lord your God and to serve him only. He was victorious when he was protecting the broken woman from an angry angry mob. He was a warrior when he overturned the tables in the temple and said, this house is a house of prayer for all nations. He was a warrior in the garden when he prayed to God. He said, God, not my will, but your will be done. He was victorious on the cross when he was being mocked. He had all authority. He could have retaliated, but he said to his father, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. He was a warrior when he cried out, into my hand, into your hands I commit my spirit. And so this morning, in a season in your life, the question is, is where are you going to throw down? Where are you going to fight? What is it in your life that God has called you to Who's God called you to protect? Where's God calling you to advance his kingdom? Where's the battle to be won? Where is he calling you to throw down? Where is he calling you to fight? You see, obedience is not something that we do in the future. Obedience is what we do today. Maybe it's in the next moment or the next hour. Maybe it's every day when you wake up in the morning. That's when the victories are won and the decisions that you and I make on a daily basis, that's when we become the victors, the warriors that God has called us to. And so where do you need to fight? Maybe you need to fight for a new mission or a new ministry. Maybe God is birthing something inside of your heart or your spirit that he wants to show Jesus to the, to the community. One of the things I love about FSN is a lot of the ministries that we have around here come from the people. They don't come from the staff. And God is speaking to you. What is it that God is leading you towards? We're here to help and to equip and to empower you to do what God has called you to do to show people Jesus Christ. Maybe there's a fight within your physical body. Maybe it's a a change of of habits. Maybe it's a change of of eating habits or or, or things to do. It's not easy at all. Maybe it's a fight in your finances. Maybe you need to start paying off debt to where it becomes zero. That's why we have Financial Peace University, because we want to equip you and we want to help you to pay off that debt that is strangling you. Maybe one of the things you need to do is get rid of your credit cards. You still got to pay them off, but start, stop charging on them. Maybe just simply making decisions of things that, that will help you get financially secure and ready. Maybe there's a fight in your marriage or for your marriage. Maybe there's something in your marriage that you need to get rid of, and it's not your spouse. Stop pointing the finger at your spouse. Maybe there's something that you need to do to serve them, to honor them, to encourage them, to lift them up. Maybe as a parent, you need to fight. Instead of being a passive parent, maybe being an absent parent, maybe you need to step forward and be intentional with your children. What are some areas in your life, in your family's life, that are not healthy, that you've allowed to happen. 
that you can fight for your family. Maybe it's a fight for the marginalized or outcast. But God has given you the ability to have conversations with those that are just far away from God. Maybe there's a fight in your career. Maybe there's a fight for your spiritual walk or an unconfessed sin in your life. What is it today that to be victorious today, you need to make a decision. It's not going to be this way anymore. What do you need to do today? To have victory is the decisions that you make today. Not the decisions you make in the future, the decision that you make today. What is it today that you need to do, that God has placed on your heart, that God has placed on your life, that you need to fight for? Because you are a warrior. You have what it takes. You have someone to protect, a kingdom to advance, a battle to win. When your, your enemy Satan comes, you will fight back. You will fight with your, his word, the word of God. You'll do battle with his word and in prayer. You declare that today enough is enough. I will no longer allow the enemy to win in my life. People in our culture, they're characterized as cheats, liars, passive, lustful, prideful, and angry. But that isn't you because you are a warrior. God has raised you up and called you to something greater than what we experience in this culture as a people of God. It stops here. It stops today. It stops with you. You are a warrior. In Joel chapter 3, it says to you as a warriors of God, so to the nations far and wide, get ready for war. Call out your best warriors. Let all your fighting men advance for attack. Hammer your plowshares into swords, your pruning, pruning hork, hork, hooks into spears. Train even your weaklings to be warriors. Come quickly, all you nations everywhere. Gather together in the valley. And now, O oh Lord, call out your warriors. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. You've called us to be into the fight. We might not think or see that we are the warriors that you call us to be. But God, you have given, someone, given us someone to protect. A kingdom to advance. And a battle to win. And so God, we take up the mantle. We take up the call. We step into the fight. Lord, I pray for that one that feels so beaten down by the enemy, so beaten down by culture, that God, they, 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 they're drowning. But God, I pray that you'd raise them up and lead them into the place that you called them to. God, maybe there's somebody here today that just needs to say yes to you. The first step, this first step into the battle is to say yes to you. I thank you, God, that you're calling men and women unto yourself because you've called us to be warriors. God, I thank you for this church. God, I am thankful that there are men of God who protect and allows ladies and men, ladies and children to feel safe because that's not part of our culture. My God, I just pray that you raise up men of God who protect those that you've called. Lord, I, called, I, I pray that you would raise up warriors, warriors in the battle. Maybe they pray in the closet and the battle is won. Or they fight in the public squares and the public places to advance your kingdom. God, give us wisdom. Lord, I thank you for today. Thank you for this body. Thank you for this church. Lord, I thank you for being an example of what it means to be a great warrior. And Lord, I pray that we'd be warriors for you as we follow you. And we thank you, Lord. Your son's incredible and powerful name that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.